Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now this week, don't despair, don't cry, I hear your cries. Merc Month 2 is over. It's coming we to have an end. one more film to do, and it's the Patreon pick that was an open vote. All what a way, film. Uh, what a film they've chosen, yeah. Um, it was an open vote, I think we had like 30, 40 votes on it, and it is 1998's Ronin. Yep. Um, it's over on our Patreon page. Every month we allow uh, the supporting cast to give us a hand and pick a film for us to cover. Um, and if you're interested in supporting the podcast, that's a great way to do it and interact and help us pick a film every month. Um, but before we dive into one of the best casts of a mid-90s action movie, Rob's actually, you know, he's turned a bit mercenary and uh, he's working on another podcast. Aren't you, oh, Rob? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I, nice little... St- Nice uh, way to segue there, Matt. That's nice. Um, Yeah, I told you I had something. Yeah, so I am part of a new podcast called the Homefront History Podcast with Andy Chatterton and Chris Colonco. Um, And every week we are going to be talking about Homefront History. So in the first episode, we talk about American weapons um, for the Home Guard that were donated by the civilians. Um, And we're going to be doing pillboxes rationing anything home front you can think of we're going to be trying to cover it um so yeah Best episode can... was great listen to it this morning really interesting oh thanks and you can find us on uh, hfh his history so all one word um on twitter and you can listen to us on spotify and itunes and acast so yeah if, if any fof fans want to go and give us some support i'd i'd much appreciate that yeah looking forward to more thanks so maybe then we should jump off and get into that cast you were talking about. Well, we've got to start with Bobby D. It, we've, oh. it, there's not many films we can cover that have Robert De Niro as the as the lead or in them, generally speaking. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this is obviously one of Robert De Niro's more notable action movies from the '90s. The other being Heat, obviously. Oh yeah. Um. But uh, he plays Sam, uh, an American mercenary, formerly associated with the CIA. Um, and it, spoilers, it later turns out that he's not actually formally associated. He actually is still in the CIA. Oh. Mind blown towards the end of the film. Mind games. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just to run down some of you know De Niro's notable films out of the... Yeah, I don't know. You nearly don't know hundred years films. Now. Where the fuck have you been? <laughs> oh, I know. So, <laughs> Taxi Driver, The Deer Hunter, which we mentioned before on the podcast, Godfather Part Two, The Mission, uh, Untouchables, Heat, uh, Jackie Brown, Men of Honor, Shark Tale, uh, Little Fockers, The Intern, uh, yeah. Dirty Grandpa. Um, see, see, he's had he's had a decade where he just did a bit of everything. So, he, like, seventies is gritty. 80s is like sort of becoming uh, more box office profitable. 90s mm-hmm. is actioners mainly, I think. Yes, yeah. And yeah, more better. comedic roles. And then as he does these comedic roles in the late 90s, he goes full blown comedy for some reason. He's just yeah, having a, um, he's having a whale of a time. He, he's he's a renaissance man. He can he can do it he all. He really is, um, yeah. And this is is in his renaissance that he had with Al Pacino at the same kind of time. They, they mm, had a 90s renaissance, I think. They did. Yeah, that's true. Um, backing him up is John Reno, uh, who plays Vincent, a, a French. Um, he's kind of a um, he's sort of like the the guy that gets the kits. He's uh, yeah, a fixer. He's, he's a fixer. He is a uh, dab hand with a with with uh, firearms. He's a good driver. He's kind of the everyman, like a wheel um, man, but but not kind of yeah. Because yeah. we've got we've got Larry as the wheel man, but um, we'll come to him in a moment. Um, and. The director, um, Frankenheimer, was very keen that Reno and De Niro have on screen like friend chemistry to the max. Yeah. It, um, it's one of the strongest things this movie. They, they yeah, really have great and it chemistry. does it really well. Like the 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 uh, we'll probably talk about this scene a little bit later on, but um, 
the various members of the team meet for the first time. And even in that first scene, there's there's great chemistry between the two of them. Mm. Um, uh, of course, Renault is known for Leon. Um, he was Mufasa in the French dub of The Lion King. If you didn't Amazing. know that, Rob. Wow. Yeah. Um, and in the more recent live action version as well. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Mission Impossible in 96, uh, R- Hotel Rwanda in 2004, Flyboys in 2006, uh, The Roundup in 2010. Uh, he was in uh, The Five Bloods in 2020, and he was also in a, uh, the French Sweeney remake as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Didn't know they had yeah. all those. <laughs> they did was that before remi- or after the, the Ray Winston one? They essentially made a French version of the, the, the Winston 2012 oh, okay. um, film that they made. Yeah. Kind of interesting. It wasn't great, that film. It wasn't awful. No, no, it didn't no. really lead anywhere, did it? I've just got to say, before we... Talk about war movies, obviously. But we're, before we move on, I've got to say how Jean Reno hasn't yet been cast to play De Gaulle is beyond me. He he would yeah look really he, great. He could play in that an elderly role. De Gaulle right now. Yeah, yeah. He, there's he's still got the look of him. Then we've got Natasha McElhone, who plays Deirdre, who is a Irish and later revealed to be an IRA operative, um, who commissions the team and brings them together to steal. Uh, it's it's a briefcase, but we don't really find out what's in the box slash briefcase. No, it's a MacGuffin, um, isn't it? It is, and we'll talk about that later on towards the end, I think. What's in the box? <laughs> so um, she's in cahoots with uh, Seamus O'Rourke, who is played by Jonathan Price. Um, Price had a long, has had a long stage and screen career. Glenn Garrigan and Ross. Got to mention that one because Rob loves that film oh, in 92. I adore that film. Yeah. Um, Tomorrow Never Dies in 97. Uh, New World in 2005. The Pirate of the Cab- Caribbean movies. Um, and most recently, he's been in The Crown. Um, but back to uh, Natasha, who plays Deirdre. Um, she was also uh, playing uh, an Irish lady in The Devil's Own in 1997, I believe, if I remember oh, right. It's been a while uh... since I saw that film. Um, she was also in the Truman Show, of course. Lots of TV. Most recently, she's been in Halo and The Crown, along with Jonathan Price. Um, rounding out the cast of the the mercenaries or the team, we've got Stellan Skarsgård, who plays uh, Gregor, who is a sort of ex East German, uh, possibly KGB Stasi type. Um, Just a bad is, bastard in this, isn't he? He is. He plays it brilliantly, and he's kind of shown in the film during the mission phase to be the tech guy he's setting mm. up the gps he's got the computer it's a giant the world's you know, chunkiest laptops ever crtv yeah crt like monitor yeah. and he's there with his so, yeah so matt wouldn't have seen this in because he didn't i don't think he had the dvd he watched it digitally um i watched the making of featurette and mm. uh Star- scars guard says that he made a backstory for his character of the guy was in the KGB. He yeah, was a very abandoned bad family person. Or wasn't yeah, it? abandoned his family. Oh, I didn't know if you'd seen that. Um, so he, he said that it's, I did my research. Yeah, thank you. And that's all right. Just in case you hadn't, I didn't know if it was online <laughs> or not. Because um, that's yeah, why yeah. I get the. You know, I we we've got the DVD collection here at Fof HQ to watch these featurettes because you sometimes just can't find them. That's um, very true. But yeah, no, his his whole backstory that he put to the character was uh, was fantastic. Yeah, I believe Frankenheimer was, you know, really impressed with the depth mm. that he gave the character, and you oh, don't yeah, he brings, get he... all of that in the film. There's a no. couple of little scenes where you know, like De Niro knocks a coffee cup off and he catches it. Yeah, it's like good reflexes and that kind of thing. It's um, good. It's a lot of there's but, a lot of nuance um, going on, a lot of background stuff going on. Oh, there's, there is an awful lot of nuance, especially in those initial scenes where they set up the characters. Yeah, um, which is one of my favorite scenes. Spoilers. Well, great. We'll talk more um, about it later. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of Swedish film work. Um, Hunt for Red October in 1990. Uh, Good Evening, Mr. Wallenberg. Uh, and Saviour in 1998. Saviour being a film about Bosnia with Dennis Quaid. Very interesting. Looks like a future one for the show, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, Railway Man in 2013. Uh, most notably, uh, Chernobyl, the HBO series in 2019. And most recently, Andor, the Star Wars um, yeah. insurgency uh, series mm. coming off the back of uh, Rogue One. 
I think he pops up in the Avengers as well, doesn't he? It's the guy of the Testament. He might well do. He might well know. do. I mean, yeah. with all of these uh, actors, there's just too much to... They're huge. It's a huge just, ensemble. Just trying to give a little taste of the breadth and, you know, some of the interesting things they've done, you know, like like um, De Niro in Shark Tale and, and the Little Fockers. <laughs> yeah. um, just don't mention the deer hunter. <laughs> he didn't even mention the deer hunter. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna pretend you didn't, so it's more funny to me. All right, fine. <laughs> Sean Bean is Spence, a character who is really played beautifully by uh, by by Bean. Yeah. I think it's really understated. Um, he's the Englishman who sort of claims to be 22 SAS, um, leading to one of the more iconic scenes from this film. Oh, um, my head canon for this is he's actually. A really low-level um, British intelligence agent who has been oh, okay. forced to go on this mission. Um, but we'll talk a bit more about that later on when we talk well, about how because I, I think he is Leo's X. character evolves and Reno's character right. evolves. I think because I have, Cause I have I, a head cannon. Yeah, because I think he might be ex SAS, but I think he might have been invalided out. No, I I think he the the way that De Niro de- deconstructs him and the way he acts shows that he has very little military experience whatsoever. Oh, okay. So I think my read on him without my headcanon is he's probably what's known as a Walter or Walter Mitty, where he's just pretending he was in the military yeah. in order to get on these I kind can of see jobs. That as well. Yeah. Yeah. They, they totally see that's that my out. read. He might have been he might have been in and he might have been in for a very brief time and he you know he might have been in like you know, TA something or something. Wasn't. Yeah, who knows? Not not disparaging the TA obviously, but No, of course not. Just to round out some of some of um Sean's um Quite impressive career, actually. When you when you look at his filmography, it's like mm. okay, like that's, he's became that's quite a bit impressive. of a meme over the years. I think hasn't he? But yeah, for genuinely... all, the, all the um the characters that die. Yeah, isn't it? but he's he's such an accomplished actor. He's very he is. very good. I saw him in um in Time recently, BBC that was series. Fabulous. That was with one of Stephen his... Graham. So right. good. Yeah. yeah, his reactions to you know some of the 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 terrible things that go on inside prison it were. Yeah, but amazing. Anyway, off way off the point, but you know, no, but uh, it, Patriot it, it, Games in yeah. 1992, Gold 95, Bravo 20, which we've covered on the pod, um, Equilibrium in 2002, National Treasure in 2004, Troy, the Sharp series in the 90s, Age of Heroes in 2011, and a very unusual film called Soldiers of Fortune in 2012, which has an amazing like premise where yeah. The, there's a a group of um, war tourists who pay money to be protected, but also to be soldiers in a war zone on yeah. like a holiday. It's kind of like Westworld, but in real life or in the real world, I should say. And it's, it has an incredible plot. cast. It's like um, Colin Meany's in there. Um, uh, Ving Reams pops up. It's such a bizarre cast, but you mean it looks Colin Meany, the airplane pilot from Die Hard Two. That's him, Windsor Airlines. You know <laughs> <Yeah>. him. Yeah. <laughs> um, then we got Skip uh, Suduth or Suduth, uh, who plays Larry, uh, and he's the the he's the wheelman. He's the getaway driver. Um, he's the man that knows how to handle an Audi uh, S8. Yeah. Throws it in the corners like a motherfucker. Um, and apparently, he did a lot of the the driving. So obviously we'll talk a bit more about how all that stunt work was done later on because it's quite interesting. Um, but apparently he did a lot of a lot of the driving himself as well. Um, lots of TV and lots of lots of nineties movies predominantly. Mm-hmm. And he's had a long TV career. Um, lots of CSI and, and those kind of NCIS shows of more more recently. Um, right in the cast out, we have a nice little uh, appearance from Michael Lonsdale, who is probably his, his best known character is. Um, Drax from Moonraker, the Bond movie in the seventies, yeah. um, especially to me, anyway. But he has, a, he has. Sorry, I'm going to sneeze. But he's had a, a super long career, um, spanning from the 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 sixties right through to the the twenty tens. Um, is Paris Burning, uh, Day of the Jackal in nineteen seventy two, The Passage, Moonraker, as I mentioned, The Bunker with Anthony Hopkins as Hitler, um, a really interesting take on that story uh, in 1981 uh, smiley's people in 1982 and uh, munich in 2005 so some interesting spy orientated mm. kind of movies 
Um, and then we've got uh, Fedor Atkin, um, who plays Mickey, who's the the Russian oligarch character who uh, wants to buy the case, the yeah. the MacGuffin case. He's in um, for like five minutes. <laughs> he is, but he's he has a, a, a nice scene with Gregor, which I think works really well. Uh, Skarsgård's yeah. character. Yeah. Um, again, one of his early credits was Day of the Jackal. Um, he was in Operation on or Go. Or grow, sorry. Uh, in 1979, he was Duco in the Sharp series. He was he played a bastard in in the Sharp series a number of times. Um, he was in Spy Games in 1999. He had a small role in uh, World War Z in 2013, and he he he's done a lot of French dubbing. So I think he is um, one of the the guys that dubs Tommy Lee Jones in a lot of films. In, you know oh, the wow. French market, yeah. Um, very interesting, and that kind of rounds rounds out the cast for this week. It's it's a small cast comparatively to some of these films we've looked at um, throughout you know Merc Month, but mm. it's again really well formed. It, some it really reminds, great actors in there. Yeah, it really reminds me of Heat. How you've just got a fantastic, really tight knit ensemble, mm. um, and there's also a, a cameo of sorts that you you, you missed. Um, so. Right near the end of the film, there's a girl screaming for her mother um, when they evacuate the ice rink. Oh, the little girl, yeah. Little girl. And that girl is the same little girl, girl who is in Saving Private Ryan when Capazzo gets shot. Trying to oh, help her. Right. Trying to that's save that him. little yeah. girl. Yeah. Nice little cameo there. Just thought I'd mention it because. Yeah, that's great. Know, that's... We've had a quite a non war movie month. <laughs> Let's quite try and keep it on track. Into production. So the film is directed by the legendary John Frankenheimer. Born in 1930 in Queens, New York City. Cut his teeth learning his trade in the Air Force Film Squadron um, in the early 50s. Um, and then his first feature is The Young Stranger. It was released in 1957. He then goes on to garner huge critical acclaim for The Manchurian Candidate in 1962. Mm. Uh, he then goes on to direct uh, Burt Lancaster for his, the lead in his 1964 film, The Train, um, which is a, you know, we must cover that at some point. It's an incredible It's film. a must for train month. Must for train. <laughs> Christ, man, all these months we we're trying to do, my word. Um, <laughs> and later in the same decade, he directs a film called Grand Prix, um, which was his first. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I think it was his first film for MGM or cinema. No, hang on. I'll cut that good shit. It's not my notes. So he directs a film called Grand Prix in 1966. And this is where he sort of cements his reputation for doing these driving stunts and like epic in-camera driving sequences he really he mentions this a lot in the pr for uh uh ronin that he it's like oh i learned i learned my trade doing this on grand prix and then i you know used it in the french connection to um sequel in 1975 um and they're talking about you know his later work there he directs a 1990 war film uh, called the fourth war where two men have a fight on a border and it could spark a war and that's like an interesting mm -hmm. film to cover uh, later and this uh ronin when it comes out in 1998 it's seen as like a bit of a career resurgence for uh frankenheimer who had been doing he had not been making films but they definitely hadn't been the height of his career like it had in the 60s um so he signs on to direct this film for mgm and he said uh, at the time and this is from a uh book called pictures about extremes films of john frankenheimer from 2008 and he says it seemed like a good thing to work on i like the characters i like the idea there were these professional people without real attachments anymore i like the fact that the action sequences came out of what the characters did rather than just one of these arbitrary things that you see all the time and i love the fact that it took place in france yeah he made a lot of films in france didn't he really did yeah he says that in that featurette that i mentioned it's like, oh, it was in France. I almost jumped, jumped at the chance. Frankenheimer are making there. just three demands from the studio. I need Paris in the winter, Robert De Niro, and a fuckload of guns, and maybe a car <laughs> or two. <laughs> yeah. How many Audis have you got? Double it, and I'm in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's written by J.D. Zeke and David Mamet. Uh, Zeke's credits include Witchblade in 2000 and uh, Pistol Whipped, which is a 2008 Steven Seagal straight-to-DVD film. So a nice mention of Seagal there. Um, but David Mamet is uh, a screenwriter, um, famous uh, for, you mentioned Glengarry Glen Ross with Jonathan Price, but uh, he wrote Glengarry Glen Ross in 1992. Ah. 
Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I, I'm going to say it again, I adore that film. Um, 1997's Wag the Dog, which is a Robert De Niro film about uh, a manufactured war or a war being manufactured to save a presidency, which is it seems interesting. Um, and then Hannibal in 2001. And then he was the lead writer on the 2006 series The Unit, which is like the American ultimate force. If you remember that one. Oh, yeah, I, that does ring a bell. Mm. Uh, the cinematography was by Frenchman Robert Frace or Frace. And he worked on the 1990 film, 1995 film Wings of Courage, which was the first drama film to be shot in IMAX. And he also worked on Seven Years in Tibet, um, 2001's Enemy at the Gates as well. So it's quite an accomplished uh, cinematographer there. And I think the cinematography in this is more than competent. It does exactly what it needs to do. Yeah. Got lovely There's some shots nice little cars. shots, isn't there? Yeah. Really, some really great tight knit uh, action sequences that need to be filmed in a certain way. And Frace, you know, gets it right. And the score is by uh, Elia Smirrell, who's a Czech composer. And his most notable credits for me were, were Battlefield Earth in 2000. Um, that, that stinker, I <laughs> think we can all agree. Mm. And then he just does a lot of uh, a lot of horrors, so like The Wrong Turn, uh, Piranha 3D, among others. Um, yeah, quite a, quite, a, uh, quite a career there. And the film's stunt coordinator was Joe Dunn, and he worked on Frankenheimer's next feature after Ronin, which was 2000's Reindeer Games. But he also served as a fight coordinator on six episodes of The Professionals in the 70s. No way. Love he did, it. yeah. And he was uncredited um, for his work on stunts in uh, The Eagles Landed, A Bridge Too Far, and Kelly's Heroes. Very cool. Nice. Yeah, very nice there. And the stunt drivers was an F1 driver called Jean-Pierre Jarrier and professional driver Jean-Claude uh, Lagniers, who did the uh, uh, two Le Mans races in the 70s, and Belgian driver Michel Newgarden, who won the G2 Le Mans race in 1997, driving a Porsche, um, wow. which is quite interesting. So, you know, that they got all the guys in to do the driving. You knew they had to get the right people in. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and those three guys are more than competent. Um, and they look the part in that feature. If anyone can find it on YouTube, but they, they look cool as these drivers. You know, it's just so easy for them to do this type of thing. It's really funny. Um, and Frankenheimer said this about the stunt driving. Um, it's from the same book that I mentioned earlier. He said, we had great drivers and we did some shots with the actors in real cars during the scenes. I got the English right-hand drive versions of the cars we were going to shoot. That mm -hmm. way we could have the stunt driver on the right driving the car and a phony steering it on the left for actors so we could photograph the actors driving the cars. I, I love De Niro. De Niro's <laughs> I'm driving fast acting yeah. face. He pushes himself back in his chair like he's on amazing. Mac 10 or Mac Force, doesn't he? Yeah. You know? <laughs> he's like... <laughs> What, he's going at warp speed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so good. And there's also a, a thing they did where they would have uh, the boot of a car, or for Americans, the trunk, would be hollowed out, and they would build a, like a, a second steering wheel inside, and a, and a stunt driver could like drive the car on top of the car. So then wow. you would you'd have a the I think Skip mentioned in that feature that you'd be sat in the car and there'd be like a piece of metal over the over the uh, foot pedals and the car would be driven for you. And you just had to act like you were doing it. Um, mm. And he was like, that's so hard it was... in itself, yeah, you know, exactly. like making it look realistic. And and these guys, I think everyone that drives in the film does a pretty good job of you oh, know, yeah. making it, making it look realistic. Mm. And that's, I think that's something that obviously, you know, Frankenheimer learned his trade on Grand Prix and French connection. Mm. So um, ex 22 uh, SAS member, Mick Gould acted as mm -hmm. the film's technical advisor. And he assisted with weapons training and close quarter fighting. And he's worked on Heat, uh, The Long Kiss Goodnight, uh, Miami Vice remake in 2006. Yeah. I think Equalizer 2, Collateral. Yeah, really famous mm -hmm. in the industry. Um, we should try and get him on. Seems like a really interesting chap. Yeah, um, it'd be great to chat to, wouldn't he? Interesting, yeah. Um, the production company was United Artists. It was distributed by MGM on a budget of $55 million. The box office, it got seven point, uh, 70.7 .7 million. So, it made its money back, but wasn't a huge a box office smash, but it was like critically well received as well. So it was kind of a moderate hit, I'd say. Yeah. Um, but not in a not in a disparaging way. It just didn't make it as much money as MGM would have liked, I don't think. Yeah. It's um, obviously not achieved the same sort of call level as heat. Um no, but it's got its I think it's its own little I've, niche. I it definitely does have its niche. I agree. Mm. Um 
I think, you know, it doesn't have that pairing of Pacino and De Niro. So it's never going to hit those mm. levels of of um, following. Yeah. But it, I think it's up there. I, it is I, up there. Is, yeah. This is a hell of a film. It's like, it, it, it's for me, it's Heat's in the same conversation as Ronin. And Ronin's in the same conversation as Heat. They feel, mm. they feel like spiritual successes. Yeah, yeah Ronin no, feels like a spiritual a success to me. Um, so it's filmed in late 1997 into early 1998, and it was released in the US in September the 25th of the same year. And it was released in uh, the UK in November uh, 1998. And the film, as I said, it was well received for its... Uh, stunt and action sequences uh Siskel and Ebert on their show you know they said it was it was more than worth a watch um at the time and I have a retro review from the New York Times from the 25th of September 98 and I'll just read you a little extract from a review by Janet Maslin she says a crew of tough customers assemble at the start of John Frankenheimer's top-notch thriller Ronin each of them is a seasoned and shrewd veteran but they've got nothing on the man behind the camera when it comes to gritty professionalism Directing like a world-weary Hitchcock with a taste for the breathtaking car chase, Frankenheimer propels this tale of intrigue through its tightly plotted paces with such conviction that he makes an action hero out of Robert De Niro. During this film's moments of fierce tension, I watched viewers in early screening quite literally biting their nails. <laughs> wow. It was a very positive review. In fact, all the reviews I read were very positive indeed. See why? I, I... Yeah. I remember watching it as a kid when it first came on TV, which would probably would have been like, ooh, maybe probably around 2000 when mm. this probably hit British TV for the first time. If it came out in 98, so. it's normally a couple of years, isn't it? Um, but I remember it being on like BBC or something like that late night and uh, being being really impressed. Be like, mm. It's very fun. Mm. Film. Can imagine Teenage Matt being like, yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of what you guys thought, we had another amazing response to the one word review. We had 142 likes on the post and we had over 100 responses. And I think maybe 70% of them were you guys going Hereford or Hereford, you know, do, Hereford. doing Hereford, doing a <laughs> De Niro's impression. So I'll just read some of them out. So Rob Shipman goes with Boathouse. Dan McClinton says mm. 45 APC. Jonathan Ware says Convoy. Uh, snarky poster says Improbable. Sean Bean lives. Um, <laughs> Jem Dudaku says Solid. The World at War goes with Awesome. Dominic Adler says Shovel. Um, and Monty the Horse goes with Brilliant. And to end another one, Chris Turner goes with Boathouse. <laughs> there were so many Boathouse. A lot of Boathouses. <laughs> That's one of the iconic scenes of this film, though. I, I mean... It is. I I I don't want to drop Rob in it, but he hadn't seen it before we did the podcast. Um, no, it was on so, Netflix when I went to uni, and I was like, right, I'll put that in my watch. And by the yeah. time I got to it, it'd been taken off Netflix. So it's, it's like it's one of the iconic scenes that that you know a lot of people joke about, a lot of people, a lot of people quote is you know what calls the boathouse at Hereford. And I didn't know what that meant until this film, and I was like, oh, it's from this. So from Colors of Boathouses at Hereford to this week's Ali Tally. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. Well, what can you say? This is this it's a car and a gun movie, isn't it? Yeah. It really it is. is. Some really interesting stuff. And it's at it's at that mid 90s point where not everything's an AR-15 yet, and not everything's a Glock yet. Um, yeah, we're not we're not in a sea of like M4 carbines. Yeah, yeah. So you get some really cool, interesting stuff. Um, I think because it's it's filmed in Europe, you have a more interesting pool of weaponry to pull from. Yeah, that's fair to say. That's certainly fair to say. Um, lots of Berettas, lots of six um, six hour pistols, lots of um, you know. FN Mini Me pops up. <laughs> yeah, Rob, Robert De Niro getting out of that car with the FN Mini Me and absolutely letting rip on that convoy. It's the most one of the most iconic scenes for me in, in all cinema. He really does I just level. Was up not that. expecting him to get out of that car with a <laughs> Mini Me, and he, he looks he looks great. He looks good with it. Like he really yeah. does lay it down. Um, like, I like to think that he 
he was in Nam or Grenada or something. Like he he was doing covert stuff at one point. Yeah, before career. he got recruited to the CIA. Kind of yeah, thing. yeah. Mm. Like he could be like an ex seal or something. Like I just mm. feel like because his drills are immaculate for the the character yeah. anyway. His drills are immaculate. Yeah. So it really sort of the it intrigue, all did his work. Yeah, there's a lot of intrigue with this character there. The gunplay in the film is is you know pretty realistic. You know, mm. um, there's there's some reloads in there which not not that many '90s films bother with. I mean, Heat no. obviously did, but I think Mick was involved with Heat as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, um, yeah. Because yeah, he has that um, through line with Man through uh, uh, Miami Vice and um, yeah. and Collateral, obviously. Um, I remember watching a. Um, behind the scenes feature on from collateral with with Mick Gould in doing um the uh you know the training with with Tom Cruise yes and the 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 preciseness that they went to with that with the drills mm. so i can certainly see them doing the same thing with de niro and you know reno and the other characters yeah definitely like they, it all comes across really well um and that you know, like the, the the guns sound punchy. Uh, you you know, you hear ricochets. You know, there's big flashes of of, of guns, and it looks really good on screen. But to be fair, the gun part of this movie is quite small. There's only two shootouts really, and then I think mm-hmm. there's people just firing guns at each other. They're not really pitched shootouts. Um, yeah. I I quite like that, and I think Sean Bean sums up Matt's profession in two lines, <laughs> where he goes, "Old gun." <laughs> yeah, so there's that scene where um, where uh, Sean's trying to bond with um, De Niro's character, and he's like, "So, um, what'd you carry? I'm a I'm a weapons man. I'm a weapons guy." Yeah, and De Niro's like, "I don't know, um, um, the 1911." Like, I like the 1911. Yeah, and and De Niro says something like, uh, "It served us well," and then Sean can try, so try can tries to well. rile him by going. Uh, so you've not done so well in the last couple of wars, have you? Like, oh, Sean, right, right. trying to trying to get a, a rise out of him. That's one of that's one of my favourite scenes where they they all get to know each other. I'll yeah, probably talk about that good. in a moment. Mm. But one thing I do like about this film, before we talk about the inevitable cars, yes. um, is um, the fact that everyone has a signature gun. So they do, don't they? Yeah, De Niro's got that 1911 we just mentioned. Uh, it's like a custom long slide 1911 um then you've got uh scars guard has a, a glock 17l the long slide glock um, oh, yeah. which he kits out in a very alleyway yeah uh, like cutting edge stuff for the for the mid 90s you put like um a bushnell holocyte on it which is a massive red dot the kind of size that is probably now too big for what you would see on a rifle, but it's on a pistol. Yeah. Now you can get like a red dot, which is about maybe an inch and a quarter, maybe yeah. seven or eight centimeters long in the base, and they mill them directly onto the slide of the pistol now. But this has got this big chunky, like um, huge, like like raised mount that slides over the the frame, and then he puts in um, an extended Glock 18 magazine. And a silencer. Yeah, it's cool. And it's just it's a shame he doesn't get to use that more because he just kind of scares a contact um with it a little bit by threatening yeah, to does. shoot a child in a park and then yeah, that was dark. By shooting <laughs> that's the like really darkest part of the film. That was dark as. I was like, um, oh god, it's gonna kill that poor girl. Well that, that's how they really nail down yeah, oh, yeah. Gregor's character, isn't it? That he, he's ruthless. Um John Renault's character, Vincent, is running a uh, Beretta 92FS in, like, chrome, which is a very 90s gun. It's goal. very cool. Um, yeah, but John Renault in this movie, just he's, 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 he reeks cool, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. You know, he's Without coming doubt. off a professional. He's, he's mm-hmm. smoking fags the entire way through. Oh, yeah, he's chain he's smoking the, his way through this. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Biff Bringer. Yeah. He's the monarch um, of the Marlborough in this film. He really is. Price is Seamus is running a, a Sig P... 239 which is like a little pocket pistol yep. really um quite an elegant elegant pick um and then yeah, jo- jonathan think... price gets angry shooting people really well he does, he does. So, he's so sinister with it as well yeah <laughs> Bla- blasts people away like you can't just shoot your way out of trouble forever john <laughs> you can <gonna laughs> damn well try um, um there's a bit where later on in the film um de niro you know 
rejects the classic and accepts modernity and goes with a, a SIG P228. Um, yes. And he, there's a scene in the amphitheater where I think uh, one of the, the Russian dudes grabs uh, a bystander, like a lady, um, and he, t- he takes a very long like shot where he just drops this dude with one shot. Very cool. Yeah. Um, after having after after being in a rough and tumble with uh, with Gregor. Yeah. Um, Hilfa, he's robbing me. He pushes him. Yeah. He? Yeah. Yeah. It's very good. That, See that, actually, that, that sequence. sequence annoyed me because, like, oh, really? it might not have been noticeable in the early thousands on like a small CRT television, but now I'm on this like you know my big sixty inch telly at home. I'm not trying to flex, but you know, you know, everyone's got a big telly now, ain't they? Um, so when when Skarsgård or Skarsgård stunt double jumps down off one of the stairwells, you can clearly tell it's not it's not Skarsgård for a split second. Yeah, his glasses fall off too. Yeah, and then you can yeah. clearly tell it's not De Niro in some bits. Especially yeah, when... there's a bit where he pops out of the car with the <laughs> law. It's, it's a guy it's that's definitely like, not De Niro, is it? Like. If De Niro takes like a large, this guy takes a medium. Like he's tiny, this dude that comes out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very true. I like um, that. That law's interesting, like actually. Sometimes see the stunt double spring. Yeah, up. it's I love it. It's a little bit of fun, isn't it? It's an extra extra yeah. level of uh, you know, you get to try and spot the stunt double. So talking about clothing there. I can't get over the fact that for me, I don't know if anyone else has thought this. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't work out who De Niro reminded me of in the first like half hour of the movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's dressed a little bit like Columbo. Did you know? Oh, in his long overcoat. <laughs> in his yeah, long yeah. overcoat. I was just like, who does he look like? I was trying to think. And I was like, he looks like Columbo. Oh, and I've a flat got cap. A, I've got to pull up like an image of him and an image of Columbo for the sweater and put it to a vote. <laughs> who wore it better? Who wore it? <laughs> who wore it better? Yeah, it's got to be that. <laughs> Um, De Niro's got some looks in this film. There's, he really there's does. a bit. There's he goes through a number of outfits, and there's there's a great bit where he has like a roll down. They go they go on um like a, a recce to see uh to try and scope out the, the the team guard in the box. Yeah, and he's wearing like this like an arms deal, isn't it? Yeah, he's wearing. The, well, it's at the hotel, and he's wearing this. That's it. Sorry, like roll neck jumper and like a tan blazer, oh, and they're so posing cool. as rich people on holiday. Mm. Um, well, that's like a that's like a suede jacket, Matt. That's very nineties, very like. Yeah, there's a, there's another bit where they're in one of the hideouts, one of the safe houses, and he's wearing this really nice little like stonewashed jeans slash grey t shirt <laughs> slash um like dark green forest green. It's um, like your dad. Everyone's dad in the nineties. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, da- it's everyone's oh, dad in the nineties. I didn't know I'd been. <laughs> Unconsciously dressing like Robert De Niro yeah. in in Ronin. <laughs> he's got all his, this time. He's got his best Debenhams stone wash on. <laughs> he's got his Russia John Russia jacket. He's loving life. <laughs> <laughs> really alienate the uh, the American listeners there with <laughs> Debenhams brands. <laughs> and from oh, with his F and F Grace T shirt. <laughs> So maybe let's move let's move on to something a little bit cars. more universal and talk yeah. about the cars um cuz there's some really it it's saloon cars getting thrown around like Co- no one's business and saloons yeah so i've got it in my you know. notes it's an Audi S8 then every Citroen and BMW saloon or coupe available in the late 90s is on mm. screen at some point in this movie yeah Peugeot yeah. 406 uh, like Citroen XMs um the the Audi S8 that that Larry asks for with the nitrous kit, which isn't used in the film, but I, th- no, it's I not, guess it's yeah. just used. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not like a feature. It's just no. In, obviously, in, in a modern movie, kind of... now you get him like flicking the button and then going. Oh Bing! god, yeah. yeah if, you'd get that, wouldn't you? If we were watching Fast and the Furious Nine, yeah. we, it would be like Larry hit the nitrous, and it'd be like <laughs> yeah. a whole like little sequence of Larry hitting the nit- nitrous. He'd fly through um, the air a million miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. and they'd like they they'd have like a, a lasso and they'd be swinging it around a tank or something. <laughs> You know, some bollocks, and um, yeah, it's got a bit weird that series. That that Audi S8 is is pure, it's pure filth. dad. It's yeah. it's cool dad car, it's isn't it? Prime Top Gear magazine mid nineties material. That's what it is. Yes, yeah. it is. That's very true. Um, I love the old Mercedes um, 450 SL, which like SAL, that. sorry, which which they, I think, I think Vincent and Sam jump into yeah. towards the end. 
like brown, just very classic Mercedes. Yeah. Brown. Um, but it looks great. It is cool. Um, there's a cut there's car an M5 as well. M5 in there as well. M5. Yeah. There's a, a there's a cut bit in the uh, the, the alternatives uh, ending that was cut. But Deirdre is attempts to drive away in a Fiat Punto right at the end, it's like a really early. Oh, I like to drive in a Fiat Punto. <laughs> like a really early Fiat Punto before they got all rounded. Oh, well, yeah, really uh, one of those one. ones. Yeah, yes. and I was like, oh, I like that car. That was my favorite. Well, that would have been my favorite car if, if, it, if it was still in the movie. <laughs> um, Just it's there's so there's a Golf at one point. A Golf as yeah. well. Yeah. They, I think Vincent hijacks a Golf, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. It's a proper car I mean, film. If you know, if you it it's really like is. bullet, but for the but for the nineties. Yeah, and they're, they're really realistic. In mm. they don't show the cars doing anything outlandish. The, the cornering isn't, you know, overblown, or it's 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 believable that they can drift an Audi S8 like that. Yes, and that, that's that. Um, and I was going to bring it on to that, that that this movie feels realistic. The things you're doing in this car feel like people could do it you know it yeah. feels real and I, and I like the fact that when they're having these chases these engines they're screaming like they're yeah, being they're pushed just they're absolutely smashing limits. the rev limits yeah i love that though because it's it's not like in fast and the furious where everyone's got like a hundred odd gears on their car and their cars never worry about anything yeah. it, they are really pushing these cars um, and one last thing i've got to mention is in lieu of a bedford this week we have a leyland daff Truck I saw the dash. Yeah, <laughs> saw I was like, it. Nice. I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> I know. Obscure. I, th- I think. I think we should buy a Peugeot wire. 406 from a scrapper and, uh, <laughs> and, and recreate some of these sequences. Yeah, but talking about the <laughs> try and find a DAF. Try and find a Leyland DAF. Yeah, and um, but there's a great thing in the featurette where um, it just shows the sort of competent filmmaking that. That Frankenheimer was was doing. Um, and, and oh yeah, I know. Quick what you're thinking. Yeah. So that when they flip that BMW um, mm. to to make it go off the motorway, like I mentioned before, they only did that shot once. So it was meant to roll and skid on its back, or sorry, its back, its hood, and then um, fall off the the um, off the, the road, fall off the road. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, in the take, it the guy rolled it, and it slid for a little bit, and then it flipped. So it was back on its wheels um, and they were worrying you know, to reset it and, you know, we're going to have to get a new car and all that. Because 80 cars were used in this movie, um, which is wow. incredible. Um, and Frank and I are sitting there watching the rushes back and he goes, no, no, no. What we'll do is, and he's got these all these people around him that they filmed at the, mo- the moment. He goes, no, no, we'll cut to De Niro in the car and then we'll use the same car that's wrecked here and we'll push it off and we'll cut back. Don't have to do it again. That you know the, the stunt driver is already dangerous, and it's that yeah. that level of skill of a filmmaker just to go no, we'll just do a cut there, be fine. Yeah, I love. He knows what will look good. Yeah, yeah. he knows. I love he knows he can make it time. work. Really does. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Um, one thing I I did read about the um, the sound the sound of the actual vehicles because we've talked about the, you know the drivers and you know the cars that we used. Um, I really like that they recorded all of the actual cars on a track and then mixed it down. And then when they were doing that last sequence, they, when they were in the edit, they looked at that and Frankenheimer listened to the score over it and it clashed Ah. with the engine sounds and the, you know, the, the external sounds and the, you know, around the location. And they said, no, what we'll do is take the score out and just let it be the, you know, the actual, sound of the chase and it works so well wow yeah because that is one thing the movie does where in the chase sequences it it holds back on its score it just gives you the sound of the exactly. engines that's it it's, it's so people masterful. rave about the heat and you know shooting mm. in you know the, the streets and giving that massive yeah. you know having a sound yeah this movie is same cars approach. what heat is to firearms is shootouts yeah you could say that yeah i mean yeah. heat's got some cool you know, driving sequences, but yeah. I think if I've got it in my notes where I, I, I was probably thinking, you know, out loud and I've, I've got this, it's one of the best of the nineties. Mm. Definitely. Oh yeah. But it's also one of the, you know, one of the best chase sequence films of all time. Like I think there's something about those locations that the, the, the tight, narrow 
um french riviera streets the 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 sound design on them the the impressive driving skill something about them it it, it all comes together into a, into a package which is like oh this is this is professionals doing a really nice job at mm. putting this piece of you know cinema together and it feels like this is a car chase between people who know how to drive and have been professionally trained how to drive yeah. as yeah. someone like De Niro would be, or, you know, someone who is trying to, you know, safeguard and defend a very, mm. very valuable package of whatever hell it was in that briefcase. Yeah, exactly. And that sort of echoes what I've got to say. One of my final thought points is that it, it does feel grounded in reality where, uh, a different director would have gone a, a different route with it and probably had cars flying through the air every five minutes and, you know, and, and yeah. probably would have had, you know, people having full on firefights on top of their cars or something like it, it in the wrong director's hands. This movie could have gone really overblown and really overcooked its, its action, but I don't think it does. I think it just, just, it just straddles the edge there and it knows mm. when to pull back. Um, you know, cars feel weighty. Bullets, as we said, bullets hit and they punch. You know, the the two squibs that Jonathan Price has spoilers. He gets killed at the end by Jean Reno. Um, but when he gets when he gets shot through the back, these squibs go off, and you really feel like he's getting hit with these bullets. You know, it's mm -hmm. powerful. Everything is for a reason. Um, One thing I did did read about the the, the uh, shootout sequences. Mm -hmm. Frankenheimer was adamant that. They wouldn't do any of that, you know, the in vogue '90s slow mo no. gunfight stuff. He was adamant that everything would be in real time, um, and that it would be as realistic as ne as as possible. Yeah. Um, just just to give it that authenticity, and and he felt that if you're going to depict violence, you should depict it in a way that doesn't, you know, make it look um, fake and cinematic. No, no, I agree. Yeah, I do. I like, and maybe talking about scenes from the film, we should probably jump into favorite scenes because there's some doozies hello there sorry to interrupt i wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on patreon as thanks for your support you'll be able to help us pick films submit questions for guests have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch and much more thank you for your support now back to the show so rob what's your favorite scene so my favorite scene is scenes uh, is mm -hmm. all the parts with sean bean because he's my favourite character in it, apart from De Niro and Renault, because they're just the mm. chemistry is on, on another level. But I like Sean Bean because he's 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 acts so out of his depth. I mean, I know he he said about his uh his character that he does feel like he's out of his depth and he's not on the yeah. same level as these guys. But it's just you get your classic Sean Beanisms in there. He, he, he calls people a bastard, which is great. He shouts bastard while he's he, shooting, doesn't he? He has probably <laughs> my, one of my favourite greatest on screen fuck offs ever to Robert De Niro, where he's, <laughs> Robert De Niro is baiting him into sort of getting angry. And he's like, fuck off. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, and then when he, when he have, the, when they have the firefight and they're, they're getting out and you can tell that Sean, this is probably Sean Bean's character's first firefight he's ever been in. Mm -hmm. So he's got this whole adrenaline rush, then he's sick. Um, whereas the rest of them know how to handle it. But he's like, I thought we were going to be Raspberry Jam back there. Oh my <laughs> it's God. Like, it's yeah. such a, <laughs> weird line but no my genuinely my favorite part of the movie is where de niro susses him out um before they do the actual heist of the briefcase mm -hmm. so it goes so de niro has asked for money more money because he's like look we don't know what's in the briefcase you won't tell us we don't have any guy yeah. these guys can be heavily armed i want more money i want money in a bank account and i want it you know 100 100k and he gestures to everyone I want it for these guys as well and he gestures to everyone but he stops his hand before he gestures over Sean Bean. You notice mm. in that sequence? Really Let's interesting. See, I never noticed that. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, he does. Um, or at least that's what I saw it as. I like um, how it builds like De Niro's character's frustration with him, and he, he he's obviously clocked instantly that yeah, he's yeah. not what he claims it's to be. It's after the um, it's after he's writing things down on a newspaper when he talks to him initially. Mm. You can't really tell what he's writing. But it's almost like he's writing down little characterisms of these people. Um, but yeah, so he, Sean gets up in the sequence and he goes over to this whiteboard and he goes, right, we're going to have a, uh, here's the role, we're going to have a shooter here, a shooter here, you know, shoot across. And De Niro mm -hmm. gets up and he goes, wipes it all off and he goes, do it again. Yeah. If this is your yeah. ambush, draw it again. And it really flusters Sean Bean. And 
And then he goes, look, you know, if you do that, you've got shooters across from each other, they're going to shoot each other, kill each other dead. But they have this whole, uh, you know, he riles him up, he tells him to fuck off, and then he, he yeah. puts a cup, he's put a cup of coffee down. And he, he asks him what he asks him what regiment he was with, doesn't he? Yeah, that's he? it. He says, you know, two two SAS. And, yeah, you said the start. And Sean says that. And um what colour's the boat house then, at Hereford? Yeah, Hereford. <laughs> Hereford. Um, Hereford, sorry, I think he says. Hereford, yeah. Hereford. And and that's that's apparently that's pronunciation of a lot of the the, the Herefords in on the uh, on the east coast of the US. So oh, okay. That's probably what makes you know, complete sense. Yeah. And then um, he yeah. Sorry, and then he riles him up so much he pushes him over with his cup of coffee and he grabs his pistol off of him and, you know, he's really sort of showing him up. And he goes, you talking about an ambush? I ambush you with a cup of coffee. <laughs> it's just a great line. It is. It's, it a is. Great, it's a great little sequence. There's a bit just after that as well where, you know, um, Skarsgård asks De Niro, what colour is the boathouse at Hereford? Yeah, and and De Niro goes, "How should I know?" <laughs> and I love it. It's great. it's great. It's great. Yeah, it's fab. <laughs> really great. Everyone's got good chemistry, good chemistry, and Sean Bean is used just enough in it. And I thought, oh, are they gonna? Is he gonna become like the villain? You know, is he gonna? Is he gonna go never and him or something? And you never see him again. They were gonna kill him off. Yes, but then they, they, they didn't that. want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think I think he's pretty underrated in this film because. He's he's annoying because he's bullshit at the beginning, and then he obviously turns out to be a fake and mm. doesn't know what he's doing. But it's one of those moments where you have to remind yourself that you're thinking that about him because he's that good at playing this character, mm. and Sean is put like portraying this on a level where you could think, oh, he's just being bullshit. But then that bullshitness is his nervousness coming through. And you yes. can see if you watch it, and you can see he's he's playing it nervous because he's realised he's in with all these guys who are professionals, um, and he knows that they're probably going to suss him, mm. but he's still fronting, like you know when he yeah. gets up because he's not asked to get up and draw out the no, the he's ambush, not. No, they're not. They're he, not even doing that, are they? And he gets yeah. up and does it, um, and that, I just think it's a really nuanced, great performance from him. Yeah, it is. And he, I like how after the initial firefight, he looks really ill and sick. Yeah. Like I, I, I almost thought, is the car- is he taking like a sly bit of cocaine or heroin or something on the side to deal with it? Yeah, yeah, you could read that out of that. Yeah. And the jitteriness yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Mm, I thought that. And perhaps. the poor choices he's making. Yeah. But it's I mean, not, I, I mentioned. Yeah. It, it's, it's not ever hinted on, but I wondered that in my own head. Yeah, well, I mentioned my head canon earlier, and my, and because obviously, De Niro's character spoilers again is later revealed to actually be still with the CIA, yeah. and he's hunting Seamus down, Jonathan Price's character, um, and it's probably hinted at that John Renault might be French intelligence or something like that. Possibly, it's never revealed. No. Um, Heavily implied, though. Yeah, exactly. And if you follow that, you know, through line, you could assume that if almost everyone on that team, except. Gregor Skarsgård's character was, you know, um, NATO Western intelligence, mm-hmm. and and Sean is probably like a low level um, MI6 agent, which has been he's been pushed into this because he's the only guy available. He's the only, only guy that was available to like get to the meat. Of yeah, maybe when, he, when yeah. they were going to be recruited. So he's been thrust into this. He's got no real experience with military stuff, and he, his cover stories is you know British Army SAS. Um, and those nerves are actually his nerves that he's worried he's going to get, you know, blown. Um, yeah. So that was that was just something that came to me on I like watching that. that. I think you could do you could you could read a lot into that character. Yeah, and I think you, that again yeah. speaks to the way that Sean plays it. And that's and that's a, one of the great strengths of this movie that everyone is worth exploring. Everyone's got mm. skin in the game. I really like I really like the characters. It's, yeah. That's what I, makes the movie for me. Going it forward. is, and yeah. one of my favorite my favorite scenes is that initial meeting of where they all meet, and it's the briefing, and they're all scoping each other out. You mentioned he, he you know, he's making notes on it on a newspaper. Um, Renault asks him a question because he doesn't understand something that Deirdre has said, and he, you know, De Niro replies in French. He's fluent, um, so you're learning all the time. Skarsgård, you know, has very good reflexes. Um, yes. You know, and you're learning little bits about 
each character, even Larry's portrayed as, you know, he knows he wants an Audi S8. He knows what's going to be the right car for this job. Mm -hmm. And I love all the little questions that the Nero asks, like, are we, are we going north? Are we going south? Are these guys going to be armed? How many of them are there? What's in the box? Um, you know, what what kind of resistance can we expect? What's in the box? Like, <laughs> how many cars are there going to be? What's in yeah. the box? Like, there's all these questions that he asks, and she gives him the bare minimum and mm -hmm. pushes back mm -hmm. really right until they're well into the mission. Um, and that sequence where that we, the subtleties of each of the characters comes out, and I really like that. Um, I'd be one of my favorite scenes is that scene with the cup of coffee and the boathouse, and all of that comes to a pinnacle. And I, I love the way that De Niro's character just gets more and more frustrated. He's like, I can't believe this guy's, yeah. is, you know, trying to pretend to be as experienced as he says he is. Um, and the way it comes to a head, but I obviously we've talked about the, the chase scenes, but we've got to talk about the way that that the convoy ambush ramps. Oh, it's because great. De Niro, De Niro pops out of the car and he's armed with an HK um, 69, which is like a 40 millimeter grenade launcher, like a, like a, like a blooper. And he hits, he hits the, the lead Citroen and then pops back out with a, a SIG 551, which is like a, like a 5.56 carbine. And he, he and Renault just pepper this um, this the other escort car. Yeah, the chase escalates. He ends up with a you know once they finally get to to the um, the car that has the uh, the briefcase in. You know, we mentioned it. He, he hops out with a with a mini me, and there's a, there's another part within the chase where he pops out the sunroof with a, a M72 Law, kind of mocked up. Yeah, and it's it's just the way it staggers and stages. It goes, it's, it's like great. A, it's, it's like Grand Theft Auto sort of weapon sort of uh leveling up isn't it you start with a lowly yeah. pistol you end with a rocket launcher yeah. it's been yeah. straight to ammunition at the beginning <laughs> of the level <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it is, it is a film that feels like it could have had a game spin-off like on a ps1 or something yeah mix, yeah. mix of driver with i don't know like a third person shiver it would have been quite Definitely. good yeah that would have been quite good wouldn't it yeah it does so i think that takes us into final thoughts nice yeah I mean, talking about like games, there. I mean, uh, for me, this movie, like it, it pre. I'm not a big fan of those Fast and Furious films. Really, I, I saw one no, in the cinema. No. I thought it was a bit of a joke, really. Um, but the film predates. They have gotten worse. Yeah, the, the film predates that series by four years, and I really feel like a film like Ronin could have, could have held up a franchise. Um, mm. you, you could have had a different yeah. crew, but you could have still had De Niro in it, or you could have still had Jean Reno. Um, they could have maybe been still hunting the briefcase. It could have fallen into a different hand. You could have, you could have done a sequel. I really think you could have, um, and because they do just enough well building for you to want to know more. Um, and I have to ask a question to you, Matt. What's in the mm. box? What's in the box? Well, I mean, a lot of people say it's fissile material, yes, like radioactive nuclear material, but. I don't know. Scar's got to put in that through the French postal system. So yeah, it's not. You've got to. You you've got to wonder. I'm sure that the, at some point it's uh, going to get clocked as being not the safest of cargoes. Not safe. Um, because um, I because I read somewhere that, that people think it was on a on a website that we we were looking at. Um, it was people think it might have been printing plates for the euro that was just going to come yeah, yeah, online. That, that was um Auto Week. Yeah, that was also, it, yeah, it's like a car block, wasn't it? We, <laughs> yeah. we were reading around of the car stuff just to make sure that we got all the car models correct. And yeah, they, they come up with a really interesting one where it suggests it's plates for the Euro, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, can, I guess if you could get a get a drop on a new currency, you could have. Yeah. Because they're IRA, aren't they? That's who they don't want this box to get into their hands of. So mm. would that have caused some sort of financial issues? Could they have purchased things with it? I, you know, it's... It's difficult yeah. to say what that would be used, been useful for. Obviously, printing money is useful, but well, you would think that the euro would just go. You know what? We'll just change the plates. Yeah, you exactly. Would just go, yeah, we can just change them. Just change the plates easily. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously, so it's some tricky people... to guess what it could be. Yeah. So they asked uh, Frankenheimer, uh, an interviewer called Bobby Bobby Wignant. Oh, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. But she asked him what's in the box, and he said it's a means oh, she's to an like end. Iconic. She's done, she's yeah. interviewed almost everyone. That's it. Yeah, you know exactly who yeah. I'm talking about. I know who, yeah. I know who you mean. 
Uh, she's got a, there's a great database on YouTube of, of her interviews. Um, and we, I do use a lot of them for the show when I can. Um, and he said, it's a means to an end. What we would have, could have put in would not have satisfied everybody. Mm. And I think that's fair. And then he does also mention, and people were mentioning it on the Twitter. Um, so I thought I'd clear it up if you're listening um, this far in. He said, um, so the, the tunnel they shot this the chase sequence in was not the same tunnel that Princess Diana had her crash in. Because I know at the yes. time, yeah, he I think he mentions in the interview that people have been asking him since he was filming, but when they were filming it, they never thought of it. Um, it never got mentioned. Mm. Um, so That's a great sequence. Yeah, very good sequence as well. And, and apparently, like Paris had had a long time ban on allowing films to film action sequences like that. You know, with gunfire, yeah, and, yeah. like loud vehicles, purely for like sound ordinances. They weren't allowed uh... to like have loud productions. Um, which I think is really fascinating that Frankenheimer managed to navigate that bureaucracy. Maybe they just thought that you know maybe mean. his pedigree of France maybe might have perhaps so might have helped. Perhaps so yeah, MGM yeah. probably wheeled the grease the wheels on that one, I guess. Right. Um, but no, it's for my final thoughts really to end Mercury Month. It's been I think it's been a fun month. I mean, I know not every film's been stellar, um, but it's been a fun month <laughs> again. But it, no, it's a film. It's got good car, great car chases, good villains. De Niro's always great to watch wherever he's in. Um, and Frankenheim was just a master of this type of film. Mm. And it's mm. if you like Heat, if you like Taxi, if you like the the sort of late Renaissance sort of gold, not I would say Renaissance, but the sort of late nineties action. If you like a film like um, The Castle, this film will be for you. It's if you haven't already seen it. You know, I'm sure everyone listening has, but it's just a proper good, proper good film. It's it, yeah, it's really solid. I it, I, I suppose it doesn't quite fit the mercenary bill, but it's just in there. It, no, it, yeah, they are mercenaries. Ronin is I, I, the definition oh, yeah. at the start. It's it's a merc film. It is, and I I do like that part with um with Michael Lonsdale where he's sort of talking to Nero through this. Um, the concept of you know fallen samurai yeah. they've failed to protect their lord 47 ronin have to then um kind of take revenge and it's great um it it's a great premise i wish they'd actually you know they would make a a decent film out of the actual story of the 47 ronin other than the really weird one with keanu reeves in. yeah that wasn't fantastic um, yeah you can know, speaking of which actually um there's a bit where um de niro gets shot through a kevlar vest oh you didn't mention that in the um, italic, did you <laughs> yeah i completely forgot about that and he they they go to um uh john pierre's house played by michael lonsdale and uh john Renault vincent pulls out the bullet from um uh, De Niro's uh, side. It, it's gone through the the vest, but the vest has slowed it down. And then he talks about it being um, a Teflon coated bullet, um, yeah. which is a really interesting nineties um, kind of. It's not a trope. It's, it's sort of like a, a phenomenon where it became a uh, a MacGuffin of, of its own, kind of. Because if you remember in like uh, Lethal Weapon three, it features there's a cop killer bullet in there that yeah. penetrates armor. And it was something that was developed in the 90s. It's like a Teflon coating on bullets, but it wasn't really to make them any better at penetrating stuff. Um, it was, you know, it was, there was other reasons for it, you know, to protect the ammunition. It was to make it penetrate a little bit better through glass, actually, um, right. of all things. Um, but there's a little sequence in there where it makes a mockery of all of, you know, the John Wick kind of bulletproof coats and stuff. Yeah, oh God. Um, yeah. Where, where De Niro's taken a battery from this one round at relatively close range, mm. where he's gone through the Kevlar um, and bruised him quite badly as well because he sort of limps around for a bit. But then yeah. he's rolling around on the floor with. But, but with then they people. have that great sequence of of, of Sean next sequence of so. surgery, which is great. Yeah, it's great. It, it is, once they remove the bullet, sequence. he's like he has a really cool action. He sort of one liner where he goes, "Okay, if you excuse me, I'm going to pass out now." Yeah. Can you sew me up? Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna pass out. Now. Pass out is great. <laughs> it's just fab, you know. But, and, and it, I mean, to conclude on my thoughts, I I agree. It's a, it's a really solid piece. Frankenheimer knocks it out of the park with the direction. I think the the cinematography is really nice. We've we've waxed lyrical on the the, the chase sequences and the gunfights, and I think 
it all comes together into such a brilliant little package of an of an action movie. Yeah. Um. And I'm I'm glad it won. I'm glad it won the the Patreon. Oh no, pick. it did. I, yeah. I, I uh, it resoundingly won the Patreon. Oh pick, god, we had like some good stuff in 80, there. 20 percent. Yeah, like, no, like, it was resounding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been a fun one. I've enjoyed doing Mystery Month two. I mean, perhaps if everyone enjoyed it, let us know. We'll do a Mystery Month three in another year or so. Yeah, um, yeah I don't, think, I don't give think everyone I a rest. Stomach one for another year. Yeah, maybe <laughs> keep that. Mystery May, Rob. Let's go. Oh crikey! <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, no, but thanks yeah, for it's everyone. Been it's been good fun. Yeah, it's been good fun. Thanks everyone for sticking with us in Mercery Month. We are back next week with a uh, um, bit of a different episode, but we are still talking movies. Yeah. We're talking to the team who are from a film that you may or may not have heard of that's been doing the rounds on Twitter called A Memory Ode, which is a film about um, a Lancaster bomber crew in the Second World War. And they are uh, currently trying to raise funding for their short film project and we're talking to them about that and how you guys could get involved in uh, making the film it was a fantastic chat so tune in next week for that one thanks for listening everyone you can catch the podcast in all the usual places fightingonfilm.com for the back catalogue there and just a quick bit of housekeeping before we go if you're still listening um, we're on Acast now so you can find us on there Um, and I don't think anything else has been affected you still listen to us wherever you get your podcasts um, and yeah, hopefully we're in your rotation. Give us a download, give us a share, a like if you're new from Acast. And we'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye bye.